to episode 19 of Sell Smarter, Sell Faster. I'm Danny Buckley, your host, and as always, I'm joined by Shay Smith, our producer. Hi, Shay. How are you doing today? Hey, Danny. I'm good. How are you? I'm excited to be here. Yeah, me too. This is um, a topic that I really, really love. So I'm going to run through this opening stuff so we can jump in because there's a lot of really good stuff to cover. Um, So as a reminder, this podcast is produced by Lee G2, which is by the Center for Sales Strategy. We are a sales performance agency. We specialize in helping businesses sell smarter and sell faster. And we do that by using inbound marketing and sales enablement strategies. And this podcast is a weekly podcast focused on sales growth. You can expect fresh insights, strategies, um, and of course, real world examples that are aimed at helping business leaders like all of you listening, take your sales enablement to the next level. That is the name of the game for us. So tell us um, a little bit about where people can find us, Shay. Yeah, so we are streaming on all major podcast platforms as well as YouTube. So if you like what you hear and you want to join our community that helps others sell smarter and faster, make sure you are subscribed wherever you prefer to listen to your podcast. But also, if you ever have any questions or you want to connect with us on a topic or something you've heard, make sure to visit sellsmartersellfaster.com. You can connect with us there. And also, Danny and I are both on all the social media. So if you ever have a question or just want to connect, find us on social media. Our links are in the show notes. Um, And we'll also put those on the video at the end if you're watching on video. Great. And this topic, so we're talking about personal branding, thought leadership, um, specifically for executives. This is really near and dear to my heart. Um, Obviously, I do things like this podcast because I see the value in it, but we've really seen it uh, work really well um, at our company and for our clients. Um, It's not just about being seen as a thought leader. That's great. Of course, like, you know, good ego stroke or, (laughs) you know, um, nice to know that you are seen in a certain way. But what it really comes down to is, can this actually grow your business? And can it drive revenue? Can it drive leads? And and so much more. And the answer is yes, um, when you do it well. And so that's what we're going to get into. Um, And Shay, I know you have a couple stats to kind of just share, just to kind of paint a broader picture of of why this is so important. Yeah. So I found um, an Edelman and LinkedIn study. It's the 2021 B2B Thought Leadership Impact Study. And I I found some interesting stats that, like you said, I want to share that I think um, really contribute to what we're about to talk about today. First of all, let me find my notes here. All right. More than 51% of C-suite executives say they spend more time consuming thought leadership than ever before than before the pandemic began. I think that's really interesting how that shift. I don't know if it was just more people were spending time virtually. They're there to see it. But I thought that was really interesting um, to note. Also, 54% of decision makers and 48% of the C-suite say they spend more than one hour per week reading and reviewing thought leadership content, whatever form that might be. Um, And then as far as B2B buying decisions, this is really important because uh, as we're talking about thought leadership, like how does this affect, you know, your sales and your results and selling smarter? Um, Here we go. Let me find my notes. I'm, I'm double dipping here. Let's see. 83%, there we go, 83% of a typical B2B purchasing decision, researching solutions, ranking options, and benchmarking pricing happens before a buyer engages directly with a provider. I think that's huge. Thought leadership content has got to be quality and good and educational. And then um, when B2B thought leadership is done well, it significantly influences brand perception and buying behaviors throughout the entire decision process. And some stats that um, they related to that in that study, 42% invited the organization to bid on a project. 48% awarded business to the organization responsible for the thought leadership. 53% decided to increase the amount of business they did with the organization. We always love that. And then 54% purchased a new product or service from the organization that they had not previously considered buying. So that is, I want to one more time say the name of that study. It's the 2021 B2B Thought Leadership Impact Study by Edelman and LinkedIn. So if you want to check that out, it's out there on the interwebs. But I don't want to spend any more time talking about stats. You can go look those up to support this um, conversation. I want to bring in our guest who I'm really excited about today. His name is Marty Sanchez, and he is the founder and CEO of Influence Podium, an agency that helps B2B companies build a media arm and create thought leadership content to win on brand. He is driven to help B2B companies and CEOs 
own their narrative and share their story. Marty is also the host of Podium Stories podcast, and after hours, you can catch him either boxing or writing stand-up comedy and poetry. So with that, I'm going to bring him into the studio, and I'm going to jump out. Y'all have a great conversation. Thanks, Shay. Welcome, Marty. Hey, Denny. How are you? Great. It's so good to have you here. So excited to be here. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah great. So we're going to jump right in if you're ready. I'm ready. Let's go. Cool. All right. So um, just I like to kind of give people an idea. Obviously, Shay shared your bio, but um, tell us a little bit just about your experience and background kind of related to what we're talking about today with executive leadership and, and why is this topic important to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I after I graduated college, uh, I started working as a freelance ghostwriter. And I started ghostwriting for CEOs. Mm. Uh, most of them were either agency owners that were in the process of building and scaling their company. Um, and they needed to create content, but they didn't have the time or the skills to do it. And writing was the one thing that I knew I could do well. I don't do many things well, but writing is one of them. Uh, after that, I remember having this conversation with my first client where he said, I really want to build my personal brand and create leadership content. But I have you. I have a video editor. I have an audio editor, a podcast editor, a designer, and I'm running my own company of 30 people. I don't have time to do all this. What if we put this together? And I said, if we do put this together and will you hire us? And he said, I will. And then I said, give me 30 days. And that's where Influence Podium was born uh, cool. from the process of being ghostwriter to really becoming a, a full media company where we can help B2B companies create thought leadership content. That's awesome. I love when, uh, uh, you know, a business is truly formed from like a very specific need that you were like, okay, I can do that. Uh, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was that choice of like, this is so obvious. Why yeah. are we not doing this already? And yeah. when you can have that agreement of we'll hire you and we'll be your first client, it made perfect sense. Yeah, that's great. So specifically talking about kind of like that personal branding and thought leadership, um, you know, I feel like thought leadership is one of those many words that's that's being used and thrown around a lot. There's things that I think are called thought leadership that aren't quite. Um, so can you just define thought leadership for us in your words and, and give, maybe give us an example or two? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, marketers tend to ruin terms, right? And, and <laughs> yeah, thought leadership, we're, really good at that. <laughs> we're good at, we're great. We're great at ruining stuff. Um, and thought leadership is one of the terms. I use it because it makes sense for people, uh, but it's not something I love. My easiest way to describe thought leadership is your reputation at scale, right? But back in the day, we used to have reputations as business owners. But they were very local. It was your reputation in your city, in your industry. Now, you, with how the internet has democratized the tension, now our reputation is all across and globe in the globe. Uh, so when you're doing thought leadership, what you're doing is being proactive about building a reputation as somebody that knows what he's doing and that can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And B2B buying processes are basically based on trust. Can we trust these people to deliver for us? Can we trust this company to f solve the problem that we currently have? So it's just being proactive about what people think when they think of you. Do they think of you as somebody that is an expert in the field or do they not think of you at all? Yeah. And, and I, I think that's the key of thought leadership. Love it. Love it. Um, any any examples that are just like just obvious ones, just so we're all everyone's on the same page here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a very famous one uh, is Gary Vaynerchuk, who has built yeah. his agency through his personal brand. Uh, but when I talk to entrepreneurs, that's an outlier. That's a high end case scenario. Uh, but it happens on a smaller version uh, and it happens way more often. So I love to th th for entrepreneurs that are listening to this uh, podcast to think about who are the people in the industry that they value and they respect. And in most cases, it's because they're put out thought leadership content consistently over the years. Great. Love it. Yeah. Great example. Gary Vee. <laughs> people, people yeah, that's him. an easy one. Or you that's love him or you one. hate him, you know, which is yeah. what works, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what kind of impact or outcome um, can... You know, you talked about like trust, right? Like that's such a big piece of this. Like it's a way to build trust to people you don't actually get to meet, right? Uh, or not always. So but what other kind of the impact or outcome can someone expect if they really do have truly strong thought leadership? Yeah, absolutely. So we look at this. Um, it's a great question about how do we measure content? Uh, not just thought leadership, but in B2B, content is hard to measure. We have a three uh, hierarchy level uh, KPI metric system that we try to uh, take care of. The Great. first metric is inbound revenue. And inbound revenue is the number one thing that you should be looking at and optimizing for. That's the North Star. 
That's, that's the ultimate goal of thought leadership content. Actually drive revenue from people that reach out to you. Uh, then we have some level two KPIs that are very important and really matter for businesses. Uh, one of them is length of sales cycles. So if you put out thought leadership content, there's, your sales cycle should be shorter. Uh, number two is win rate. So you should be winning more deals because they're inbound, they're qualified, people already trust you as they come in. Um, and then you should be generating more SQLs. But when I talk about SQLs, uh, sales qualified leads, I mean, actually qualified leads, people that come to your website and say, I want to talk to sales or I want to book a demo. And those are the three level two. And then there are some level three uh, leading indicators like brand hours, engagement rate, yeah. uh, branded traffic, impressions. Those are the things that uh, you should be seeing, but you should not optimize for. Uh, but these are some of the other benefits that, that you get when you put out thought leadership content. I love it. That was really my next question was actually to take it one step further. Like, how can people tangibly uh, measure this stuff? But you just you just outlined it. So just to kind of repeat, I mean, the number one, right, is that inbound revenue. Um, and you're, you're speaking our language. This is the kind of stuff that we're measuring with our right. clients. So it, I, hopefully people are listening. Are, some of this sounds familiar. Um, length of sales cycle, win rate, you know, how many proposals are actually turning into customers? Um, how many of your, how many, S, what I call, what you describe as SQLs would be like those bottom of the funnel SQLs, right? Yeah. So the ones who are, who are hot, who are saying, yeah. I want to talk to you, not like, oh, this is a really great organization that is a great prospect, but they just downloaded an ebook, right? Right. No, it, it's want, not as good of intent. Yeah, I want, want real books, buying intent. But, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> great. Yeah. I love that. So those are all really tangible. That's really helpful. And I think um, that helps people realize that this isn't just about, oh, I have, you know, because like as an example, we have this podcast. I can't measure necessarily. It's not easy to measure whether people that listen to this podcast turn into a lead, right? And that's what people want. They want to know how many people listen to this and did they do this? And you can't always do that. But we can track these KPIs over time when you have more and more thought leadership content. Um, and, and that sounds like that's what you're kind of saying. Yeah. And the one thing I'd recommend... Uh to really take care of B2B attribution. You can pay for a lot of software. There's tools. Some of them work so to a certain <laughs> expect. Uh, but the way we really measure things is on our, um, on our form to book a call with our salespeople or with me. You, we put out a, a field that's required and it's how do you find about us. And it's an open field. We don't want to put multiple choice because that gives bias answers. But we yeah. want to have an open field that's required for them to actually have to write how did they hear about us, how did they find us, why are they here? Uh, and that's what gives the most uh, useful answers. And some of them are very qualitative. It's not everything quantitative. But a lot of our conversations when uh, and sales conversations, they come from, I heard to your podcast, and then I read your newsletter, or I saw you on Twitter. And that's when you really see what's working, what's not working. When you're forcing people to tell you how they got there, and then on the sales call, you can dig in a bit further that's the best B2B attribution system that we find. And it's the most basic. I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think even um, both, I love that it's an open and informed because I hate when it's dropped down. I hate when I get asked yeah. that and, the, and the, my answer is not available in the drop down. I'm like, wait, right? <laughs> like none of these, I, but I have a very specific answer. Um, and I, but I love that you mentioned in the sales call to like elaborate because I'm of the belief too that, you know, the way marketing works, people might only remember the most recent thing. It doesn't mean that's the only attribution, but it's a great starting point to start the conversation. Like, oh, so you said you listened to the podcast. Have you heard about us? Oh yeah, actually a friend that used to work there recommended your podcast. And so I love the, the follow-up, I think. And this is another example of sales and marketing alignment. If you have sales just regularly doing exactly. that, reporting back, oh, that's so helpful with attribution. Exactly, 100%. Because the things that happen behind the scenes, especially in B2B, are more important than the things that you can measure. Yes. You, you can measure downloads of an ebook, but mm -hmm. it, that's not the real story, right? Yep. Or, or, for example, we have clients that say, SEO is working really great for us. And then you look at the numbers and it's people looking up their name. So it's not really SEO. It's that you're building a brand somewhere else. Yeah. And then people go influence podium on Google and then they find us. Yeah. Uh, so it's the real attribution story versus what actually is being measured is different. And it's very important that sales and marketing align and give you the real picture, or as good a picture as you can get. Yeah. What I also think, and tell me if you think this is true. Um, this is how we are inside our organization a lot. Is sometimes it's also just 
uh, not like a numbers thing in where it is just a feeling where you start to say, gosh, I'm noticing all the time that people are approaching us because, and they mention your book or they mention your blog and you just start to like have this buzz internally. You're like, oh, like we're just hearing about this stuff more. 100%. Qu qualitative data is the most important data in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and especially in B2B when, uh, and when we have higher deal sizes, you yeah. don't need 50,000 leads. Yeah, you need a hundred that are qualified and that you're going to close 20 to 40% of those. That's all you really need. Um, and then when you start listening to qualitative data, it gives you the real story. Uh, when somebody approaches you in a conference and says, I was listening to that podcast. That was great. That's, I told my friend about it. That's how he reached out. You start seeing what works. You're not going to be able to track all of it. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Because the problem with marketers, and I'm going to run here, but a lot of marketers, we track the things that we can measure. Mm -hmm. and that's the things that we double down on just because we can measure them, not yeah. because they're important. Yes. I think it's necessary that we do the things that are important, even if we cannot measure them as well. Yeah, let's just, we can just end the conversation now. Everybody remember that line. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at the metrics that you're focusing on. Are you just focusing on them because they're what you can measure? And I think often that is the case. I know with our clients, that's the case for sure. They're like, well, we want this is and I'm like, I swear this isn't as important as this, you know, like, but and it's, it's often not the marketers fault. It's yeah. often that they have to report to somebody, right, yep. to the CMO and the CMO needs numbers and the CMO needs numbers because the CEO needs numbers. Yeah. So I, I don't want to blame marketers that are at the front lines. Totally. Uh, it's more of a mindset from an organization yeah. perspective. Yeah, great. So I, I could sit and talk about this all day, but <laughs> I'm going to transition our conversation a little yeah. bit. Um, Let's talk about content. Uh, that's the name of the game, right? So uh, what is the, tell us a little about what you think the role of content is in thought leadership and and anything that you think is you've seen work really well, like people love, I know it depends, right? That's always the answer. It does depend, but tell us like, what have you, are you seeing just like really work well? Um, and, and any tips on figuring out what kind of content someone should be creating? Yeah, great question. Uh, let me break those two questions. Yeah, that was apart. a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, role of content. I think, uh, let me backtrack. I think yeah. a lot of companies are wasting their money and time putting out content without a good strategic narrative that aligns their content. So when we, I talk about strategic narrative, I'm a big believer of this. This is the first thing we do for our clients. We spend two weeks on this. It's what, let's define the message that we really want to put out. Before we ever put out a piece of content, Let's yeah. clarify the message. What's the old world that we used to live in? What's the new world that the market's going to go? Uh, what changed in the middle that made this new world possible? And how does your company become the vehicle that helps companies from the old world to the new world? Right? For us, it. it's uh, B2B companies used to need PR to communicate with the market. Then the democratization of attention happened. And now we have Twitter, LinkedIn, podcasting, YouTube, Medium. We have all these channels where we don't need PR and the new world, B2B companies can own their narrative and own their content creation and we're the vehicle. So once you have the strategic narrative that overarches the old world to the new world and then content reinforces that strategic narrative on a daily basis. So that's how I picture it. The content is just your strategic narrative reinforced over and over and over again so that you create mental availability in your market so that you can educate them so that they know that they can trust you. And so that when they're ready to buy, you're the only option that they want to go with. So that, that's how I see the role of content being. And then in terms of how you actually put out content, it's a very tailor fit decision that should be discussed on a case by case scenario. Uh, I think you need to reverse engineer where your audience is. Uh, mm -hmm. Are they on LinkedIn and Twitter, podcasting, mostly for B2B, those are going to be the right answers. Uh, and then what are your company's unique skills to create content that resonates with them? Do you have a great CEO that can put out personal brand content? Maybe let's use that. Uh, do we have a great team of writers that can put out uh, great long form articles? Maybe let's use that. We have great video content that we can create case studies around. Uh, so you're able to identify where's your audience? How do they want to consume content? What type of content do they want to consume? And what's your company's unique skills that allow you to uh, achieve that? Uh, so f from all there, you mix it up and then you realize what are the best two, one or two channels that content creation should yeah. go. And then you double down on that until that works. And then you stack up more content initiatives over time. Uh, but that's how I kind of see the content creation system working.
I love it. As you're like saying that, I'm like envisioning a Venn diagram of those things, right? And it's like, okay, what ends up being in the middle? <laughs> yeah, I have it. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. it has other things, right? Like what's your budget? And yeah. uh, what are some of the things that are going to deliver some quick wins? Because a lot of people put out content and they don't see wins for too long. They give up. So having some quick wins is important. What mm-hmm. are some of the channels that we think are going to deliver the most probable success path? Yeah. Let's go with that. Uh, where's your audience? So, so you have that Venn diagram and then you find the one or two initiatives that make sense. Yeah. And that's what you double down with. I love it. And I, and I, I think it's important that you mentioned, I mean, obviously it's like thinking about audience and, and thinking about resources, but you kind of touched on too, just, um, and I'm going to expand here. Tell me if this resonates, like, Th- thinking about who is who's going to be the thought leader and what is a good fit for them, right? Like I, I've seen some folks who just really want to do a podcast, and you hear the person that's hosting the podcast, you're like, this person should not be, <laughs> right? You know, but maybe they're an amazing writer, right? And so it's like find the right channel too for the right person that's going to work. Absolutely, I started as a writer because uh, that's like my my core skill is writing. And it took me three years to really put out any piece of video content or podcasting. Yeah. But for the first three years, I doubled down on what I knew I was good at. Uh, yeah. Once I got that covered and I was like, okay, this is on autopilot. Like this is running. Let's expand and let's add more to it. But I, I had to figure out what my skills were. And as long as they resonated with the audience, that was good enough for me. And that's what I focused on. Yeah. Love that. Love it. Um, so Let's let's think if this is a priority inside of an organization. So those that are listening are like, yes, we know we need to do this. Maybe we're doing it a little, but not as well as we could. Um, I, a question we often hear is like, who would lead this effort, right? Um, so is it the executive that wants to be the thought leader or the face of it? Is it, um, do they have support? Like, what are you seeing, especially in the B2B space? What does that normally look like internally? It depends on the company size. Uh, for smaller companies, it's, only the CEO, usually when they have maybe one person in marketing or, or nobody. Uh, for companies that are getting bigger, it's a great question. Uh, so I, I've changed my answer over time. Uh, yeah. I, initially, I thought the CEO has to run it. Um, then I became the CEO of my company. I was like, I have a lot of things to do too. So I, <laughs> I so maybe not. Um, <laughs> and I think eventually it has to be, CMO has to be a big part of that. But it only works if the CEO believes. So the yeah. CEO doesn't have to run it, but he has to buy in 100%. Because if the CEO doesn't buy in, it's not going to work. And I, yeah. I have a lot of marketers that text me or, or send me DMs. And they're like, my CEO, CEO doesn't believe in marketing uh, and doesn't believe in content and thought leadership. Uh, how do I convince him? And there's ways, but my most honest answer is change companies. Like, if this is really important to you, go to a company where the CEO believes. Because when the CEO believes, now we can open up the creativity much more. Now that it can really work. Yeah. I've seen uh, Wistia, uh, which is a YouTube competitor for marketers. Their CEO is all in. He's mm-hmm. on all podcast shows. They have created shows that are different. They're all in becoming a media company, putting out thought leadership content. Uh, Micro Acquire, he happens to be a client of us, uh, so self-promo. Uh, the CEO believes in this and he's doing podcasting every day uh, and he knows we have to build a brand through marketing. For the CEOs that don't believe, the CMO has a very hard time convincing and eventually they go back to the old mindset of what can we measure? Yeah, got it. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to throw in a new question that wasn't on our original question list because I'm just curious. So, you know, we work with a lot of industries that are... um, I don't know, lack of a better word, like maybe not the most exciting industries in the world, right? And so like when you were saying this idea of like, you know, companies being a media company, that resonates for me. And we often hear pushback, um, even just around inbound marketing, like we don't, what what content are we going to write about? This isn't interesting people, you know, so I'm curious, are there, are there industries that you don't think can do this or, and what would you tell those that maybe have less exciting, you know, topics? Yeah. So I, again, something I changed my mind earlier in my career, I was like, I just want to work with the most exciting companies. Yeah. And we still obviously want to work with those. Uh, but then I realized that the companies that are more technical, the companies mm-hmm. that are a bit more boring, so-called, it's great because there's no competition. Yes. So yeah. it's the most open space that with the bare minimum, you stand out so much because nobody else is doing anything. We work with a telecom uh, company in Australia. Um, 
that it was deep technical. It was tough. But they had four competitors in the world and none of them put out every piece of content. So when they saw their CEOs putting out content on LinkedIn, this was extraordinary for the industry. Uh, so when you're the more technical you are, the more boring you are, the mm. more of a competitive advantage you have if you do take that step, right? It takes the right people. It takes the right CEO. It takes the right leadership team. It takes the right partner to help them. Uh, but it's the most wide open opportunity to say, if we do the bare minimum, if we do barely just putting out some good LinkedIn content, yeah, we're going to stand out so much. And it's great. Yeah. I love that. So all of you out there listening who think, what do I have to say? Like, who cares about, you know, X, Y, Z? It's really true because there is, there's there, and you can be creative and you can make a boring or serious industry or technical industry fun and creative, or it doesn't even have to be. It can still be serious and you can still stand out. So, yeah, and honestly, it, it's not boring. You just like creativity. Exactly. You know, you just like openness of thought. Yep. Uh, there, there's no boring industry. Um, they're just people that don't want to take a step forward. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Your, your competitors will. But... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great. I love, I love this conversation. Um, just to kind of round us out, any closing tips or, or trends that you're seeing, just something that, um, might help someone like get started right away or that you feel like you, we need to pass along before we, we say goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it comes more down to the mindset of content creation and thought leadership. Uh, con building a brand is not something that happens by tomorrow. It's not mm -hmm. something that happens in a month. It's not something that happens in three months. Building a brand takes time, takes effort, takes investment, but it's transformational and it drives business results. It's not a selfish investment for your ego. Not that CEOs, we need any more of that. We, we already have big enough egos. It's not for you. It's for your company. And it's just another content channel for your company to share their message, share their story and educate the market so that they're buying how they want to buy when they're ready to buy. So in my opinion, it's very important to have the right mindset more than anything. The skills can be acquired. The skills, you can hire agencies, but the mindset of this is a transformational change for our company and how we communicate with our market, with our potential investors, with our potential employees, with industry influencers. It's not just prospects. Mm -hmm. having the right mindset is the first step to have that uh, initiative be successful. Yeah. Love it. That is a great closing thought. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It was so good to finally meet you. And um, yeah, this has really, really been insightful. Hey, my pleasure. It was great to talk to, to this about you. Yeah. And we've got your information on the video as well as in our show notes. So um, definitely reach out to Marty, connect, um, check out their website. And yeah, thanks so much for joining, Marty. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Have a good one. Bye. Hello, I'm back. That was awesome. Thank you, Marty, for joining us. Thank you, Danny, for the conversation. Um, I love this topic. I could have sat here and listened to that probably another hour, but obviously we can't take the show that long. Um, I do know this is a topic that our company, Lead You To, is very passionate about. Um, so we do have some resources on thought leadership and related things on our website at sellsmartersellfaster.com. If you want to go there, I'll make sure there's some resources linked um, that you can find related to thought leadership. I know Marty puts out a lot of great information, so um, you can find his connect info in the show notes if you'd like to connect with him and his company, Influence Podium. Um, so make sure you are subscribed at your preferred podcast platform or on YouTube so you do not miss another episode of SellSmarterSellFaster.com. And if you would like to connect with Danny, I'm going to put her information on the screen here if you're watching on video. It is also in the notes. And then I would love to connect as well if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm there a lot talking about inbound marketing, you know, all the things, sales enablement. We both love both of those topics. So with that, Danny, do you have anything else to share with us today before we wrap up? Just join us for, um, which I believe is the last episode of this season, um, next week, Kim Orleski. Um, we're going to be talking all about uh, a topic that I love also, virtual selling. Um, another thing that has changed dramatically in the last two years. And so that's going to be a really rich topic uh, to jump into. So yeah, join us. Don't miss it. And um, we'll see you next week. Happy selling, everybody. <laughs>